Hi, and welcome back to the Sustain, Change and Grow podcast, the podcast that shares ideas and inspires change for a better and more sustainable world for all. And I'm your host, Dilara Salahova. Forests. For many people, this word may evoke sweet memories of playing in a forest as a child, picking up mushrooms, running or having a nice walk with the light softly transpiring through the leaves. Forests are beautiful, gorgeous. Forests are a world by itself. Just think about Amazon forests. Or imagine yourself surrounded by green hills covered by forests somewhere around in Southeast Asia. Forests play an essential role for humanity by providing a wide range of ecosystem services. To name just few, forests clean the air, filter water supplies, control floods and erosion, sustain biodiversity and genetic resources. Standing forests are powerful carbon sinks, but cut them and they will become carbon emitters. Currently, forests all over the world are in danger, putting in danger the wildlife that inhabits it and the humanity itself that relies on it. While individually we may lack resources to protect endangered forests, it turns out that we can plant our own tiny forest that bring huge benefits to the environment. And in this episode, we will talk a lot about forests. What is the difference between a forest and a plantation? Who is Sebastiano Salgado? What is a tiny forest? How tiny forests help with biodiversity? And how one can grow her or his own tiny forest in a place as small as a backyard? In today's episode, I have a great guest, Nikolaus Tarukella Levitan. Nikolaus spent two decades of his career producing documentary films about forests around the world. For large European TV broadcasters such as RTE, Deutsche Welle and BBC, as well as NGOs like WWF or Greenpeace. Now he's on his personal big project to plant tiny forests in Poland, raise awareness about the green transition and much, much more. And let me mention it now, in case you don't listen until the end of the episode. If you want to support Nikolaus' project, you will find the link to the donation page in the description of the episode. Nikolaus, and a warm welcome to the Sustain, Change and Grow podcast and looking forward to our conversation. Hi, Diliara. The pleasure is all mine. It's an honor to be with you and uh, to be able to talk about forests, which I love very, very much. <laughs> yeah, and let's start with this. So you have really a long life uh, career of uh, documentary uh, filmmaking and a lot of your films are dedicated to forests. Uh, is it a coincidence or is it a choice? A uh, little bit of both, I would say. I have lived for 10 years in Brazil and um, spent much more time uh, during my lifetime. When I moved to Brazil, it was shortly after the Rio 92 convention. So the Amazon rainforest was a big issue at that time worldwide. It just came up that I had to do a lot of, um, of films in the Amazon. And being in the Amazon means being in the forest uh, still. <laughs> and uh, so I really had to dig deep into, at first, rainforest and uh, tropical rainforest. And it became more and more fascinating and that's where my interest for forest ecosystems and and forests in general came from i i believe okay so before going deeper into the forest ecosystems and all the specificities <laughs> of forest let me just ask you a more general question so you have seen forest kind of all over the world so where, what is common and what is different between forests in Brazil and Germany? We depend on forests everywhere, no matter if we are talking about tropical rainforest or boreal forests or kelp forests in the ocean. Forests are among the most important ecosystems for the planet. They store a lot of carbon Still, healthy forest ecosystems are always biodiversity hotspots. 
and they preserve what we need for a living as mankind. So I think that's what unites all the different all the different uh, kinds of of forests and when i talk about forests i'm i'm not talking about monocultures for for wood production production but of highly diverse uh, natural ecosystems forest yeah so ecosystems. what is the difference this uh, uh, forest and plantations or what you call the monoculture uh, production uh, units a healthy natural forest ecosystem grows on its own and the world was probably once covered almost entirely by forests. Um, and these forests were and continue being um, very diverse. They have a high biodiversity of plants, of funguses, of animals, of invertebrates, vertebrates, insects. And it's, it's, it's huge and very strong and healthy systems. They're the opposite of the plantations we see not only all over Europe, but also in, in other continents where you have huge pine plantations or in Australia you have uh, eucalyptus plantations and also in Africa you have a lot of eucalyptus plantations all, all over the world because it's a fast-growing wood which is very easy to sell and, and use in lots of different ways. But monocultures are not, don't host biodiversity and they are vulnerable. We have, we have these death of uh, forest systems uh, all over Europe and in Germany it's very strong. We have this bug which is attacking uh, basically pine trees and it destroys hundreds and hundreds of hectares of pine plantations because these pine plantations don't have uh, natural resistance. Yeah? There's mm -hmm. nothing else. There's only pines and they suffer from the drought of, of, the climate, uh, of the climate crisis. And when they suffer from drought, they become vulnerable for the attack of the bugs. And then the bugs kill the trees and then they kill the whole forest. And this is something that cannot happen in a healthy uh, ecosystem because... Um, in a, in a diverse ecosystem, there are always other animals or other plants that prevent such attacks in large scale because there would be animals to eat the bugs, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah? There's a natural food chain. So there is you have a natural food chain, exactly. I mean, we have been destroying forests since the Roman Empire. Um <laughs> If you look at the at Yugos, uh, former Yugoslavia, the, the, the Balkan states, yeah, uh, those used to be um, used to be beautiful forest ecosystems, and it has all been cut down for ships, mm -hmm. for shipmaking, and later on for house building. So we have destroyed our our healthy forests for thousands of years already. I think we have forgotten how a healthy forest looks like, because it's pretty chaotic. It's not, you know, it's not like this. <laughs> where it's very <laughs> convenient to walk. <laughs> where it's very convenient to walk and you don't hit and you don't fall into a hole. And, uh, and you, you don't, don't have, have many bugs. insects. No exactly. Insects. You don't have bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, a healthy forest looks very chaotic and wild. And you have, usually you have, for example, around a third of all the biomass in a forest is dead wood because dead wood is not dead wood is very uh, very much alive because it feeds funguses insects uh, birds it's always a process of of reconstruction and reliving and and rebuilding the forest yeah. and during your work so what are the most inspiring facts that you learned about forests like when, when you heard about them you said like Wow, really? <laughs> Can it be true? <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the most inspiring films I did was um, 13 years ago or so. I don't, I don't remember exactly. It was also in the Amazon. And it was a film about the flying rivers. The flying rivers, we learned during uh, the process of filming, are humidity that forms over the Atlantic Ocean and is taken in direction to the Andes 
all over the Amazon. And this humidity is being enriched by the humidity that evaporates from the forest, which is up to a thousand liters per tree per day. <laughs> so these flying rivers and these and these they form clouds and a lot of humidity and um before the andes and from the andes you have strong fall winds and they detour the clouds to the south east east of latin america which makes it possible that there is agriculture and that there is humidity usually a big part of south america would be desert because if you look around the globe Everywhere around the globe in that height, you have deserts. In Africa, in Asia, uh, you have deserts, but not in Latin America. And this is due to the flying rivers of the Amazon. So if there is no Amazon forest, there wouldn't be any agriculture. Exactly. And this is what is um, happening now. The, uh, there is a disruption in the flying rivers because of the, um, of the destruction of the Amazon rainforest. This is a very strong, but also a very uh, sensitive system, and it is fragile, and um, it is part of one of the tipping points for the climate crisis. If the mm -hmm. flying rivers are interrupted, and they are about to be, and they already they are, they 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 are not all the time all over the year. They come at certain times, but they're absolutely necessary for. Uh, for agriculture and for, let's say, decent living in the biggest part of South America. We already see that, that they are not happening, that they're not forming, because uh, the Amazon rainforest is partly drying out. So it's already been studied that the, that the trees don't, don't contain that much humidity anymore as they did before and, and the soil. So um, there is a very huge risk of uh, savannization of, of the Amazon rainforest. Nobody can say it exactly, but uh, it could happen in five years' time, ten years' time. And um, if that happens, it's, uh, um, it's a process that can't be stopped anymore. And how aware are people there about this problem? That depends on who you talk to. Mm -hmm. The traditional populations in, in, in the whole Amazon area, uh, they are very well aware because they live with the forest. Uh, the big problem is that there has a huge influx of uh, colonizers um, in, in Brazil, it's especially from, from southern parts of Brazil, farmers and cattle ranchers. They are the big problem or one of the big problems because they slash and burn and put their kettles on the on the on the destroyed land and that works for two or three years then there's um, not enough nutrients for the cattle and then comes uh, chemical fertilizers and soy and then the whole system is uh, broken so to say but the traditional population especially the indigenous population they know how necessary the forest is and how ne necessary a healthy forest is and, and that we are part of this system. Mm -hmm. That if we destroy the forest, we, um, we destroy the base of our living and of our livelihood. And this, that's why it's so important to listen um, to traditional populations, not only in Brazil, but all over the world, because you can observe this knowledge and this wisdom everywhere from the Arctic to Asia, Southeast Asia and um, all over the Americas. So, uh, and in Africa, of course, also. So we have to listen to traditional populations because they have a wisdom we have lost. As... What, what, are, what are these main uh, items of this wisdom? The most important point is that we are part of nature. We are not above or beyond nature. We are part of nature. If we destroy the nature of this planet, then we destroy the possibility to survive. And we are seeing this right now. Yeah? We're seeing mm -hmm. this right now everywhere. And it's not a question of the forest. It's, it's, I mean, we are suffering the biggest biodiversity crisis ever, the, 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 the biggest mass extinction since the dinosaurs. And we, we are doing this. We are doing this. Every one of us. The most important lesson is actually to acknowledge 
that we depend on an intact nature, on intact working, functioning and diverse ecosystems everywhere. And how can um, this indigenous people uh, be involved in the forest conservation efforts? Well, they are actually are already a lot. Research in institutes work a lot with indigenous knowledge, knowledge already. There has been this little film I have been contributing to about tiny forests and uh, forest systems in Europe and Germany and in Poland. And um, there are a few scientists from Eberswalde. Eberswalde has a university. Uh, it's called the University for Sustainable Development. And they're researching a lot on forest ecosystems. And they invited, actually, a group of uh, indigenous elders from Colombia, the Kogi people. Uh, you can Google that. They're, they're famous for their connection with forest ecosystems and with forests. And they walked with them through um, a typical destroyed pine tree plantation in Brandenburg in um, northeast Germany. They looked at at the whole destruction and they said, well, you know, this is nature healing itself. These trees don't belong here. There is sickness and nature is taking care of that. So nature sent these bugs to kill these trees so that healthier trees that belong here are able to grow and take their place. A very simple and very modern approach because this is what modern forest uh, engineers and scientists are saying. Yes, these plantations that we have here, they don't belong where they are. We just planted them because we can make money from it. This was a very nice example. And I mean, you look at these people and you say, oh, oh, funny indigenous people with their funny clothes and funny hats, you know, but they're wise. They know what they're talking about. And uh, they have this millennial wisdom and we should take it and take it very, very seriously because but they can, can they, help us survive. Can they really help with the struggling forests in uh, in Europe? Or they are more uh, they have more wisdom about the, the Amazon forests of which they take care. Indigenous people, wherever they come from, they always they have learned to live in functioning ecosystems, and they are they all they have this in common. They understand themselves as part of the ecosystem. So they always know we should not, we shall not destroy what we are living from. Yeah, but okay, that's a yeah. good point. But then uh, uh, people in Brazil uh, or in other countries, they need to, actually they need to live and they can't uh, live with forests, right? So uh, because uh, people need to eat and uh, mm -hmm. the population is growing and there is uh, some sort of a conflict of uh, having trees or feeding the population, right? And we know uh, th this case in Brazil. Well, we thought that was a conflict, but it actually is not. Because if we cut everything down, there won't be no agriculture anymore. And Brazil is the best example for it. If the Amazon rainforest dies, there will be no more agriculture in all over South America. This will affect about 500 million people who live in that area. We have to find ways, yes, to live from an intact nature, not only from forests, of course, but also from forests. There are many concepts and we, we have to work on that. There are food forests, for example. There are agroforest agricultural projects, lots of them. They're growing everywhere. It, they're also an invention, actually, from the Amazon. Agroforestry means you you learn from from nature you learn from biodiversity you join plants that help each other because plants are social trees are social they interconnect they communicate they even trade trees and funguses trade they trade sugar if we acknowledge that then we can find ways to survival of mankind and of nature together because it 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 has to be seen together as one a simple example of an agroforest uh, project, chicken under trees or even cattle ranching under trees because cows love shade. They like to be in the shade. They, they feel better there. 
they can dung the soil so the trees grow better. And then you can plant trees that you can use for wood production or whatever. They were in Brandenburg. They had a very funny plantation of together Christmas trees and raspberries, which help each other a lot. And in smaller scale, you can see this in permaculture gardens, yeah, where you put together certain plants which prevent, for example, snails from eating the carrots. Yeah? So you plant them together and they help each other. And in the tropics, you can plant cocoa together with a pineapple. They give each other nutrients and shade, and so they grow better together. And this is nothing else but copying nature for food production purposes. Let us, for the moment, uh, wrap up a little bit with the problems. From what I understand from what you said, so the problems with forests in Europe is that they're very much uh, monoculture, mm -hmm. and so therefore there are uh, problems with diseases that uh, kill mm -hmm. trees, uh, etc. So because actually we already lost uh, the majority of the natural uh, proper forests, right, that can be self-sustained. So while the problems with the other countries like Brazil or more developing countries where the natural forests are still there, the problem is with the cutting and the elimination of, of, the, of the forest area. Is that correct? Is there anything else that uh, I have missed? Um, not only. I mean, uh, also in, in developing countries, uh, th there has been cut a lot, huge parts of Africa and also in, in South America. There was a huge ecosystem in Brazil, uh, which is called the Cerrado, which is kind of a, a wet savanna ecosystem that has almost entirely been destroyed for agriculture. It, it was also, it, it was a unique ecosystem. Don't have anywhere in the world. It's only, only in Brazil. And it's basically gone. Mm -hmm. It's gone. And there is only soy. And if you, if you drive through that area, you see 360 degrees soy to the horizon. And it used to be a very, very rich and beautiful, healthy ecosystem. So you have it everywhere. The, the, the destruction is already everywhere. And in, yes, in, in Europe, we, we started earlier. <laughs> <laughs> but in Brazil, they started around 40 years ago or so when, when, when they turned to becoming a big producer of beef and soy, agricultural products and, and minerals, basically. They, they said, oh, we have, we have all this area. And so let's cut it down and um, produce let us now move to the question that uh, is closer to us, <laughs> which is the forests in Europe. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, the, your project uh, of planting a forest in Poland. Can you tell me more about what you are doing? Well, in Poland, there is a similar problem. There are enormous uh, pine tree plantations, uh, which people consider forests because they don't know better, because this is the whole forest they, they've seen in their lifetimes. There are also beautiful forests. They have the last real prime natural forest in, in Europe, which is Białowieża at the border to Belarus, which is a beautiful region. My wife and I, we, we bought a very tiny house uh, in a very, very tiny village in uh, Western Pomerania, close to the Baltic Ocean, uh, to the Baltic Sea, a couple of years ago. And we were very welcome in that little village. Uh, people were very nice and we found wonderful friends there right away. As we both have a pretty international background, we did a lot of different stuff in, in our lives and we've lived abroad and we've seen a lot and we've experienced a lot. And we, we thought, well, let's give something back to these people who are here on the countryside where nothing happens, basically. Villages are forgotten, the rural space is forgotten culturally and stuff. So we started to organize small events, barn concerts, a Brazilian concert, yoga classes, uh, kalanetics classes, and people were a bit surprised why we did that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had fun and they had fun. Then came uh, the moment where we discovered this video of Shubendo Sharma by occasion. We were just doom scrolling on TED Talks and we, we found this video about tiny forests. I was like, wow, tiny forests. 
beautiful thing. Tiny forests are highly diverse mini ecosystems for urban spaces developed by a Japanese botanic uh, named Akira Miyawaki in the 70s. And Shubhendu Sharma is an Indian uh, businessman who adopted this uh, strategy or this technology and developed it further and made a company and planted lots and lots of tiny forests in India and Pakistan. And we were amazed about this. And then I discovered that there was actually already someone planting or, or planning tiny forests in Germany. They did the first tiny forest in, in, in Brandenburg. And funny enough, the guys who did it uh, were studying together with my daughter in, in Eberswalde. So I thought, wow, let's do a film about this. This is beautiful. This is a wonderful project. I want to do a film about it. And I tried to, and nobody wanted the film. And then we thought, okay, if nobody wants the film, we have 10,000 square meters of soil. We, we are no agricultures. We are, we are not farmers. Let's plant a tiny forest in Poland. Let's plant the first tiny forest in Poland. And so we did. And we developed the project with the help of this uh, organization from Brandenburg with Mia. Fall of uh, 21, we planted our tiny forest, four and a half thousand trees on 1,500 square meters, together with around 200 volunteers from Poland, from Germany, from Mongolia, from Colombia, uh, from Chile, from everywhere. So and they flew from all these countries to plant No, trees? they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't. They were living in Brandenburg, actually. Okay. <laughs> so they came a very short distance, <laughs> just around 100 kilometers they came. But most of the people were actually from Poland. We had school classes there and we had the villagers from, from our village and from neighboring villages. And it was a beautiful project and it worked out. And um, yeah, now the tiny forest is blooming and growing and it's wonderful to see how it worked out fine. So how big is it in terms of the football fields or whatever? <laughs> Oof, 1,500 square meters. I don't know how big a football field is. You can actually plant a tiny forest in a space of 200 square meters, which is a tennis field. That is enough for a tiny forest. Okay, and yours is bigger. Ours is pretty big and we weren't aware of how much work that this would be. <laughs> so we, if we had known before, we, we might have planned it a little smaller. But now, of course, we are happy that it is, uh, that it is so big. But uh, it was a very hard work because you have to plant it very quickly. You have to do it in one, two, maximum three weekends. You have to plant all the plants together, spring or late fall. Tell me more, a bit of more details. Like what is the specificity of the tiny forest? How different is it from a forest, from a plantation? So like what it involves, uh, etc. The idea behind the tiny forest is to have more biologically rich, biodiverse and healthy spaces, nature spaces in cities. We are not in the city, but we planted it as kind of a um, kind of an example of what's possible because not everyone has this space to plant. So um, it involves first you do a research on which plants usually grow in that region where you are. Yeah? This is a scientific research, so you have to find out which plants uh, are actually endemic from there. Then you choose between twenty five and. 40 more or less different different species and it's not you, only trees right it's not only trees you have four layers you have the shrub layer you have uh, at the ground layer you have the shrub layer you have the uh, the smaller trees and the bigger trees so you occupy the whole space and you plant three plants in every square meter and every forest engineer says, oh, this is impossible. You cannot do that. The plants will kill each other. No, they actually help each other. Uh, is grow. it three plants or three trees? Three plants, three different plants. Okay. Yeah? You, like for you mix them. I didn't, prepare, I didn't prepare the English names for our trees. 
<laughs> so we have we have I mean um, we have uh, we have larches we have uh, we have raspberries we have oaks we have birch trees uh, very few beeches white thorn also bushes uh, so you you occupy all the layers and the do you plant also like um, flowers or grass or is it something that will come by itself? Well, the grass comes uh, by itself, unfortunately, because we, we are in a region of reed. There's a swamp area mm -hmm. and we have a lot of reed. It's actually a very, a very healthy region, peatland. And so we have a lot of invasion of reed in our forest, which which we don't want to have there, but we, we have it there. So you have to manage a little bit. Yeah. One very important detail I, I forgot to mention, you have to prepare the soil very thoroughly. Thoughtfully, um, you have to dig out the soil one meter deep. You have to do a soil analysis. You have to see what's missing in the soil, which which quality has the soil. This is especially important in urban spaces, of course, because sometimes you just have rubble. You don't have yeah. really soil. You have rubble and everything there. So sometimes you you ha re actually have to change. We didn't have to change the soil, but we had to enrich it with straw and compost. And we add mycorrhiza, which is fungus spores, which help the, the plants to connect in mm -hmm. the soil. Yeah, the roots connect mm -hmm. via the, the uh, neural uh, networks of uh, of the funguses. If you have very poor soil, you can also add tejapreta, which is something from the Amazon originally, which is uh, natural kind of historical compost made of all the leftovers from indigenous people hundreds and thousands of years ago. So it's... You mean it's human bodies? <laughs> um, well, <laughs> actually, you find a preta on historical grave, uh, grave sites. Uh, okay. in, in the Amazon, you, where you have you, you have these huge burial urns, they're beautiful, and where you have these, you always have the habreta because there were settlements, and so you have ashes from vegetable coal and uh, the remains of food and everything, and this turns into a very very rich black preto, uh, black soil, black earth, which has been studied in, in the last few decades and is now being reproduced, reproduced uh, for, for a lot of, uh, for a lot, a lot of uses also uh, in Europe or, or wherever. And you can enrich the soil uh, very well with that. But we didn't need it because we have a relatively uh, rich soil in, in the region. So we didn't. Uh, we... Mm -hmm. Enriched soil makes it possible that so many plants can be planted all together. It actually grows, this tiny forest grows up to 10 times faster than a natural forest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it actually grows faster. It is much more biodiverse, mm -hmm. uh, both flora and fauna, right? And mm -hmm. uh, it has uh, many benefits of having it in, in any area, basically. Yes. I mean, it's it's especially nice in, in urban areas. It's uh, being, uh, they're being planted uh in hospital gardens, in front of kindergartens, also where you have apartment buildings, instead of having a lawn, you plant a tiny forest. And the idea always uh, involves bringing children, school kids uh, to these forests so they can learn about nature. And of course, it helps the soil. It helps for cleaner air. It brings biodiversity back into the city. It, bl it brings humidity. It brings humidity. And it just makes you feel well. You mm -hmm. know, it's nice to sit in the forest. Everybody knows it's nice to be in the forest. It, you actually, you feel better, a person feels better in the forest than in a gray city. This is science. <laughs> we <laughs> yeah, know that forest bathing. nowadays. <laughs> forest bathing, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, something that we discussed previously but i think it's important to mention so this tiny forest they're extremely dense so actually mm -hmm. it is not possible to walk uh, uh, through the tiny forest like it's a real amazon jungle basically <laughs> <laughs> and so, a very uh, tiny yeah <laughs> <laughs> but what is important is the design right so maybe you yes. can say some words about it 
Yes, of course. I mean, we want people to walk through uh, through a tiny forest too, and that involves in planning a little path through it, or more paths. And we, in, in our case, we we created very weird path through it with a stone circle in the middle. In our region, there were a lot of stone circles, and there's a lot of a lot of you know there's a myth, a Slavic myth, and a Viking myth, and so stone circles are a thing in our region and then we said okay let's do a stone a stone circle in our tiny forest and people will be able to sit there and and enjoy the forest and let it uh, have an impact yeah and so what is the people's attitude so how your project was perceived by the community it's very very different (laughs) (laughs) very different approach i mean we had an enormous support from from many many people People were coming from all over Poland. There was a guy, I remember him. It was a very, it was a very, very stormy weekend. And we had wind from west. And this guy was coming with a bicycle from Gdansk. And that's around 400 kilometers against a strong, really strong wind with a bike. And he came and he came already completely exhausted. And he was there to plant two days in a row with us. And we had people from Częstochowa, uh, which is also a, a long, a long drive. And there were uh, five people. They were driving all through the night and they arrived in the morning at eight and started to plant with us right away. So we saw that there is a need for projects like these. And we connected with so many wonderful people and we, we met so many people through this project. Of course, also through social media. You, you, nowadays, you, you have to use social media to connect, to find other, find other people who think like you do or uh, can engage in, in what you do. We had the now Green Party leader of Poland who, who came and planted with us. He wasn't Green Party leader then, but he planted with us and later, later on he <laughs> played a role. And so in the Green Party in Poland, they already know us also. And uh, later we had a visit from from the marshal of the Wojewodship, which is kind of the prime minister of the region who visited us. Donald Tusk almost made it also. <laughs> <laughs> they were all amazed and they said, well, let's let's give this a hit and let's support this. And we we are very ho- hopeful that in, in, uh, in fall of this year, we are going to plant more tiny forests actually in Polish cities. There are a couple of projects we don't know right now, but it looks um, looks good that finally this is uh, this is going to find its way into Polish cities because Polish cities need it. They are so gray and full of concrete and uh, all the trees cut and uh, they have big problems in summer when they're overheated and flooded when it rains because there's no there's no soil anymore. It's all concrete. They need green. They need biodiversity in the city. So it, Poland is in big need of uh, such a project. But of course, we also had other reactions. I mean, um, the forestry system in Poland is complicated. It's uh, run by by the government, which is very reactionary. And uh, they see trees basically as a commodity. And so uh, what we heard a lot was also, ha, huh, who's going to get the money from this wood? I said, nobody, because these trees are going to stand. <laughs> they are, they are, we are not going to cut them. <laughs> Nobody's going to cut them. But why do you plant trees if you don't cut them? Uh, well, Ministry of Forest. <laughs> long way to start. <laughs> yes, yes. So we also had that. And of course, people think we're funny and we're weird. We get a lot of support and we have support in our village from beautiful people. And um, we are hopeful that this will go on. What are your main struggles? Money. (laughs) Money, money and money. This is a non-profit. We are a little foundation, very small foundation with almost no means. We do this basically from our pockets. We, We are now applying for public funding. We had a little public funding for the Tiny Forest too from the regional EU fund. But it's really difficult it's really hard and um, in order to to be able to to continue and to to grow as a foundation and um, i mean we are, we are full of ideas and projects and we, we we there's such a lot of things we we could do and we want to do 
but we actually need uh, more financial support. Of course, the political situation in Poland is also not too helpful. We could always use more contributors and also more volunteers for our projects. But the basic problem is to to get our work funded. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We all come from from a settled life. We are not uh, the youngest. I'm I'm the oldest in in our group. Uh, but nobody is uh, is under forty, so we started very late with uh, with this uh, non profit work, and we have families to support. We have professions, and we have to make a living. So this is our hobby, but it's so much work. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, we are still struggling um, to find a way how we can how we can bring these things together. We would like I would like I would love to do this um, full time, but as long as I have to work for a living and make films, I have to make films and use the spare time for our project. Mm -hmm. So you also do some fundraising, right? You, you have a website. Uh... We have a website, yes. And we use more our Facebook uh, page because it's uh, very popular in, in Poland and among the people who, who work with us. So our main page to get informed is actually Facebook, fundacja-perspectiva.org. Yeah, I will put it in the description so people can Wonderful. find Wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and we have, of course, one can support us if, uh, if uh, one wants. Uh, we have also have a website, but we have to really have a, a huge um, makeover for the website. We are, we are working on that. The, the website is pretty poor. <laughs> anybody and we're on and we're on Insta. But the Facebook, the Facebook page is uh, um, where you get the most information out. Yeah, and you, yeah. it's it's active. You publish the uh, latest news. Uh... Exactly. We try to keep it up to date. And we have a big action now and in two weeks' time. Well, we had a look at the forest now. And, um, well, spring is there with full force. We had two weeks of sun. And yesterday the rain started. So it's going to grow like crazy now. And we have a lot of grass and weeds. And uh, as long as the trees are still smaller than the weeds, we mm. have to intervene and we have to suppress the weeds. So we have to mulch. Fortunately, there is a farmer who always provides us with, uh, with straw. We have a lot of straw already and we have a big action, a big joint action at the end of the month where we will call for support for weeding the tiny forest. And afterwards, we will have a salsa concert in our barn with <laughs> food and drink and dance and friends from our international friends from Berlin will come and play beautiful music. We will have a great party. I hope what we always do also is a little fire on the outside and uh, we have beautiful sunset almost every day and so we have a little fire and sit around the fire after the music and uh, look at the sunset and are very happy afterwards <laughs> sounds exciting <laughs> <laughs> do you you're very welcome to join us <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel there is more of a community spirit now when you started this project, that people feel more connected and uh, united? Uh... We feel more connected and united. Uh, by, by starting the project and by starting this work, seeing how much people got involved and interested, we saw that we're not alone. And that is something very comforting because, uh, I mean, we live in difficult times when you realize that you're not alone, that there are a lot of people out there who have the same worries and the same dreams and are aware of all the effort it takes to save our lives on this beautiful planet. That is very hopeful. And that uh, that is uh, one. I think this is the most wonderful experience we had in all this, that we're to see, to realize that we're not alone. That is really mm. beautiful. What did you learn from the more than 20 years of uh, filming in the Amazon forest? You know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an unbelievable region and I've learned so much. For example, I've spent a few weeks in an indigenous village Village. It's uh, close to the Andes in western Brazil, close to the Peruvian border. The Ashaninka people, the first indigenous people with access to internet. <laughs> so they said, you know, we're indigenous 
But living in the forest doesn't mean we have to deny progress and technology. On the contrary, we use it for us and we use it for, a, for the forest and for, and for a better living. And first they used, they used the internet to defend themselves against loggers. They, they called the police when, when there were invasions from violent loggers and, and stuff like that. And they developed a project called Apiucha. It's a school for reforestation and indigenous knowledge, pretty much in the heart of the rainforest. And scientists and students and activists uh, gather there, come together to do workshops and learn about it. And they do such such uh, such an amazing lot of a lot of interesting work. And people come there to learn with them because they they do it in a respectful way. They 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 don't exploit nature. They take advantage of nature, but they respect it. They don't destroy it. And this is the whole secret of working with with a healthy biosphere and health, healthy ecosystems. We have to learn to live with forest standing and this is something i've learned from indigenous people you know people have to make a living with the intact nature with this with the trees standing people have to be able to live from that and it is possible yeah? mm -hmm. you can live with that you can live with the fruits and of course you can have plantations agroforest systems for example which existed for thousands and thousands of years where you join forests and agriculture in a healthy way and we've just recently rediscovered this ancient technique there are people who are teaching that and they are finally they're going to university there's this crazy guy Ernst Götz from Switzerland with this syntropic agriculture he is calling that I met him in 2003 and he was such a crazy guy he worked for the German agency for international cooperation GIZ that time and he did workshops in the amazon um he did workshops in agroforestry because many of the people there had forgotten about that but they were cattle ranchers so he taught them well you know cattle ranching is not good for this nature here and not even for you so you have to use uh, the resources nature gives you this guy he he's the best example of what is possible to do he bought a completely degraded piece of land in northeast brazil in the 80s i think 700 hectare if i'm not wrong and he transformed that into basically a food forest There was nothing. It was dry, it had soil, dusty. If you look at it now, at his fazenda, his farm, it has even created a microclimate, a different microclimate than the whole region around it. And now people from everywhere in the world come to, to learn from him. And there he is still teaching and working hard. And, you know, this 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 skinny old guy, I think he's in the 80s now, but he's still working so hard. He has no electricity on his farm. Isn't that I don't need it. <laughs> I don't need electricity. <laughs> And it's beautiful there, you know. And there's so many people like him. There's so many people like him. And uh, to meet these, I think this was the greatest uh, or is still the greatest thing in my work to, to meet people who, who make a difference and who show by their own example what is possible to do with the world. And who and, is the um, most inspiring person? Is it this, this guy? I don't, I don't know. You know, one, of course, one, one of the, one of the, figures inspired me most, who I love most, is of course Sebastian Salgado. For me, he's the greatest photographer of all times. His photographic work is just to cry uh, so much beauty and depth and and it's so hard touching and he's brazilian he has lived in paris for a great deal of his life with his wife he did a long project in africa which made him fall into deep depression he, he he did a series about migration and violence during migration he worked in rwanda and congo and he witnessed unbelievable atrocities and terrible things and after that he got very sick very ill couldn't work anymore and he returned to brazil with his wife to his uh, parents farm where he grew up 
when we had grown up. This farm used to be a green space, Atlantic rainforest, very beautiful region with very smooth mountains and very beautiful, beautiful rivers. And when he came back, it was basically all dead, all dried out. His father had transformed the farm into a cattle ranch and there was nothing left of the nature. The streams had all dried out. Um, there was no water anymore. There was no tree growing anymore. It was a desert. In how many years this beautiful landscape became a desert? Well, he grew up there. When he when he got back there, I think he he was already in his 50s, 60s. But anyway, like so 30, 40... uh, three three decades more or less, three decades or so. It had it had been destroyed. His wife was the person to inspire him to change that. After the experiences in, in Africa and, and this sad experience of coming home, they needed to, to create something and to, to do something hopeful. And so they started one of the biggest reforestation projects worldwide. In around 20 years time, they planted more than 3 million trees, all endemic species on this land. And they managed to turn it into a green paradise again. They recovered the streams because they, they protected the wells by planting there. So the wells came back and from there they could spread out, actually develop this technology of uh, recreating rainforest. Because for a very long time, people thought a rainforest that has been destroyed cannot be recovered. Saugat was one of those who proved uh, the contrary. It is possible, and, and they did it. And I had the, the big honor and pleasure to visit Salgado and to visit his farm and uh, to film there in 2014 or 15. I was so nervous when I met him. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so, so beautiful to be there and to see what can be achieved if people are willing to do things, you know, really throw themselves in with everything. And just do it because they know it's the right thing to do. There is this beautiful documentary. I can only highly recommend uh, watching it about him. It's uh, already a couple of years old from Wim Wenders, The Salt of the Earth, mm -hmm. which is about Salgado. This was a spoiler because this is the end part of the film. <laughs> <laughs> But it's uh, it's, it's the amazing. journey that matters. <laughs> it's the journey, yes. And he had a he had a wonderful journey. He's he's someone who inspires me a lot because I mean he's a picture maker, he's a storyteller, and so am I. And his journey led him to protect nature in the end, and that's uh, what I'm trying to do. In, very, very small scale, but which I'm also trying to... So it's do. just the start, right? <laughs> what comes it's just the start. Yes, I hope. I, I don't know if I will be able to, to plant uh, three million trees in my lifetime. But of course, we want to, we want to do much more than only, than only a tiny forest or a couple of tiny forests. We have a lot of ideas and plans uh, for our little foundation. We want to actually, we want to change how agriculture is being performed in our region. We want to show that different agriculture is possible. For example, we want to introduce hemp. You know, hemp is one of the most wonderful plants you can imagine. You can use everything. It it enriches the soil. It doesn't demand any herbicide or pesticide. You just need special machines, which are a little expensive, but it's a wonderful plant and you can use it for everything, for clothing, for insulation, for food, for really everything. We also want to, to initiate the energetic transition in, in, in our region. We have a region with a lot of sun and even more wind. I don't know if you know, Poland, Poland has a terrible energy mix yeah, cool. really really terrible and with the actual government this is not going to change so let's hope for the best for the next elections but anyhow it has to change and we want to help to do this a little bit faster and we want to create regional communities who produce their own energy in the villages because it's possible it's perfectly possible and it's much better than to bring energy from from far away we have the wind we have the sun so let's put up there the windmills and the solar panels 
Can people afford <laughs> yeah. it? Can people not afford it is the question. We cannot afford what we have in the future. The transition is coming. And the, the question is, do we perform it on time? Because the cost of the fossil model we are living now will be much, much, much higher than any transition now. And of course, there's a lot of support already. You know, in Germany, there are already many, many small cities and villages. They are energy positive. You know, they produce their energy. And it's cheap. Yeah, but now it's cheap. is not Germany, right? So Yeah, but the technology is cheap. Solar, solar energy is the cheapest energy on the market. Solar panels are cheap now. You know? Of course, you have an investment. Yeah? yeah, and the investment is the problem. So you have to create mechanism, and this is not for us as a small foundation mm -hmm. to 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 it. But we want to we want to push uh, politics to to do that, and that's that's very necessary. We have to create mechanisms and tools so that people can support these investments or get support from. But, but there there is no other way. Yeah, we cannot not do it. Yeah, this is for sure. But then if we take uh, any individual family who lives from salary to salary, just, you know, for mm -hmm. basic needs, we can't really request them to install solar panels uh, saying that, well, look, you can't afford it. <laughs> you can't afford to keep using coal for your heating. Yeah, you, you, you don't have an idea how, how, how expensive burning material is in Poland now pellets and coal and, 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 and oil. There's no basically no gas heating in, in Poland or very little, but it's all incredibly expensive. You know? So we are already at that point to say, well, you know, it, you can try to go on paying an incredible amount of money for something that is going to end anyway, or you you try to find ways to get out of that. And we want to try, we, we are looking for ways to, to, to get out of that. Of course, we want, of course, we want uh, support from the European Union. Mm -hmm. yeah? And we're looking for that and government projects and maybe from the regional government, because the regional government is a, is much more, let's say, modern than, than, than the federal government in Poland. And it's probably, uh, it's possible to work with them. And there are initiatives of citizen communities generate electricity. We are working on that too. We want to create a system of communal transportation without cars in our region. Mm -hmm. There's no way to come to our village without a car. We have to change that. We want to change that. How do you, you know? see the role of your foundation? Like more specifically, what exactly can you do? Ideas, mm -hmm. basically ideas. And this is also one of the projects for the not so far future. We want to turn into an activists and, and ideas hub. Mm -hmm. yeah? we, have this, uh, we have this beautiful barn, which is pretty run down, but it's, it has a perfect format for events. And we, we're doing it, events there on a base, very, very basic level. Our dream is to transform our foundation and our village to a hub for ideas for the necessary uh, transition. Yeah? We want to bring people together in the village, on the countryside, because it's there where things are decided. It's not only the big cities. Mm. Yeah? The rural areas are so important. So we want to bring people together at our place. And we want to create a lot of examples of what is possible. We want to have the permaculture garden. We want to have the tiny forest. We want to have clean energy. We want to have electric bicycles you can rent. And we want ecological construction with playhouses. Yeah? We want to show all that. And we want to have people come together at our place and say, look at this. This is possible. Why don't you do it at your place? Yeah? Why, don't you, why don't you do it down in the south? Or what, what are the materials you could use there? What could you mix it with? Do you have more wind? Do you have more sun? What is possible there? Oh, we have uh, little streams. Uh, we are in the mountains. So ah, yeah, are you using that for creating energy? Hmm, good idea. You know, mm -hmm. We have to bring together people who want to transform, want to use their ideas and bring us, bring us in front. And this is what we want to do with our foundation. This should be the place where people gather and exchange ideas and then go back to their places and change things. Mm -hmm. That's our dream. Sounds beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's see where we get. <laughs> what is permaculture? 
Permaculture is kind of agroforestry on small scale, where we where we plant uh, vegetables without any herbicides or pesticides, and we use the interaction of uh, different plants to protect it from diseases or insects or snails. Snails are always a problem. <laughs> <laughs> And you can do that on basically any soil because you create the soil for the permaculture garden. In Poland, this is something that's very nice. People in Poland and in Eastern, in Eastern Europe in general, they are not so distanced from food production. Mm -hmm. They are more connected in certain ways. They are more connected with the soil, with the earth, because everyone has cucumbers, potatoes, tomatoes in the garden. And, it's like um, in Russia. Yes, ah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> People know how to produce food, but sometimes they forget the connection to nature. Recently, we talked to a farmer of our village who is cutting all the trees and bushes around his, his uh, plantations. And we said, why are you doing that? You have to protect them. No, the trees are drinking all the water from my plants. How could you think such a thing? You come from the countryside. How could you possibly think something like that? It's the opposite. The trees maintain your soil humid. They protect your crop. People have forgot a lot of things also. And... Um, But this depends, no? So, for example, uh, once I was, um, I don't remember now where, in some dry uh, region, there were many eucalyptus trees. And mm -hmm. so the eucalyptus trees were not uh, native there. And actually, they're known to drink a lot of water. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a problem because the region is becoming yes. drier and these trees, uh, they're drinking a lot of water. So is there any kind of difference between trees and trees, like those which preserve water and those which are drinking yes. water? Yes, of course. Of course. I mean, eucalyptus is from Australia. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be here uh, in the first place. And ask people in Portugal what it does. And the eucalyptus plantations are basically responsible for the, those huge forest fires they have there because they have these, these eucalyptus mm -hmm. seeds that are very oily and they actually explode. Mm -hmm. yeah? They explode. They, they, they catch fire and they explode. This makes sense in Australia because this is the way eucalyptus trees actually spread out their seeds. That works in Australia, but not elsewhere. Mm. You know? mm -hmm. And there are very few trees that destroy the soil in the way uh, uh, eucalyptus does. So, like the Kogi say uh, from, from Colombia, they say, well, <laughs> you have to trust the trees that grow in that region naturally, when, 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 that, that are endemic, that are native there. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is so important, and you and you need the mixture. You, know? mm -hmm. you need the diversity of plants. You cannot say, oh, you know, beech trees are wonderful. Let's plant forests with fifty thousand beech trees. Yes, well, but no. <laughs> <laughs> you you have to have diversity. You have to have diversity. So it's only the diversity which maintains the self sustainability, right? Because that's the only yes. way how trees and yes. plants and bushes can interact with each other and the provide necessary functions to each other exactly the biodiversity helps us you know, we, we we always saw it as, as something you know disorderly kind of you know which is so uh, chaotic and no but biodiversity is our friend we have forgotten that now we have to get back we have to get back to that and and we do you know we can do it with small steps because for example a permaculture garden is a very easy thing to realize in in your in your backyard and there you can see how biodiversity actually works uh, for example one of our neighbors uh, who's making honey she was so thankful she said oh great you're doing the, you're doing the tiny forest and you're doing the the, the the permaculture garden wonderful finally my bees will get food again because they don't have food they don't find food anymore so i have to feed them sugar mm. well nice honey <laughs> <laughs> That's what a lot of people do because the bees don't find honey. I uh, don't. I don't find. Don't find plants to feed on. And the more different types of food you have, the more different types of bees you also have, and yeah. it all comes together. One block onto another. Yes. Going back again to this conflict uh, between uh, standing trees and fallen trees. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we know why uh, in Europe we cut trees, right? Because we needed mm -hmm. space to live. And uh, it's difficult to have a huge population living in the forest. 
what we need is some sort of a balance, right, between uh, uh, the space where we can live and the space, the, the wildlife, uh, the, the forest that we preserve. Uh, ideally, maybe sort of a mixture of the two, or uh, interwaving uh, textile structure. What is your view on this? <laughs> Well, f first of all, we didn't we didn't cut the trees to build our cities in the first place. We did it to conquer other countries and to and to exterminate other peoples <laughs> and cultures. <laughs> yeah, this was the first thing. Uh, later, we we built the cities with what was left. We won't have a world uh, only covered by. Uh, forests anymore probably never i don't know maybe in a million years who knows the question is not so much uh, uh, diverse forests because we don't have many diverse forests anymore we we reduced them everywhere in the world really really bad yeah everywhere the question of the available space is more a question of our agriculture and at the moment we use our agriculture to feed animals and not to feed people mm. so first of all we have to change our agriculture turn back into producing food for humans instead of uh, doing the detour via cattle this is a huge thing to do there forests can help again not natural forest but agroforestry systems well, that can combine food production and forests and biodiversity we have to think agriculture in a completely new way we have to basically reinvent our civilizations. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if we we shouldn't go there because it's really <laughs> uh, this is such a yeah. But oh, you actually experience. like your point on the agriculture is absolutely right. So the fact that I have seen recently is that ninety five percent of the agricultural land of France is used to feed the cattle. It's crazy, isn't it? So, yeah. I used to be a big meat eater. You know, I've lived in Brazil and Brazilians are, I mean, they're kings and queens of barbecue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think even more, I think they have a higher higher consume of meat than, than the Argentinians, if I'm not wrong. And they produce a lot for exportation. And I have eaten meat for basically my whole life. I stopped completely. I don't need that anymore. And I think we should all stop. Stop it, you know. We have to change. We have to change so much. <laughs> we have to change every aspect of our lives if we want to survive as as as, as mankind. As Polish mankind. are also big eaters, I would say. Like like. Right? Oh yes. So how do oh, they? Oh yes. They do. <laughs> Uh, it's funny because we actually, this was a process, this was a process when, when we had our first event, when we had our, our Brazilian concert, we, we made a Brazilian national dish, with this, which is feijoada, which is a kind of bean and meat stew. We did two versions of it, a meat version, uh, because the Polish love <laughs> to eat meat. They wouldn't come otherwise. Polish people. <laughs> <laughs> and we did also a vegetarian version, which tasted very well, very nice. We continued doing that for some time during our events, offering meat and vegetarian dishes. Until we got to that point that we said, no, why? We offer food. We offer delicious food we have some somebody who cooks wonderfully in, in in our village and she she does almost always the catering yeah we said you know we are offering something here we determine what is there to eat i mean people can eat here they can you know stuff their bellies they can eat as much as they want and it's all delicious but from now on it will all be vegetarian we won't offer meat again yeah and people are like, okay, hmm, well, this soup actually doesn't taste so bad without meat or without sausage, kielbasa, or, <laughs> you know. So you can help people discover other possibilities. Yeah. You don't have to say, oh, stop eating meat. No, I give you food. Yeah. It's just without meat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. Haven't thought about it yet. Haven't tasted it yet. But it tastes good. Yes, it does. And it's more healthy. And it protects our resources. Yeah. Yeah. Very this is soft. actually our approach. I am a person who speaks a lot and who always tries to convince people to do to act in a certain way or stuff, but it's terrible. I, I shouldn't do that. And so 
I mean, the, 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 the way to, to convince people is always and only by example. It's just like education. Yeah. It's love and example. Yeah. And also Nothing actually else. make experiencing. So because yes. Uh, yes. instead of a thousand words, just try it. <laughs> yes, exactly. And this, and we, and and we use this this approach in in everything we do, you know. And we we started as an intercultural experience because, uh, well, we have certain issues of racism, mm. yeah. And so we said, okay, yeah, we do a workshop or something on 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 racism or whatever. No, let's do a concert. Mm. Let's have a party. Let's have a Brazilian party here. It was end of October. It was really freaking cold in the barn. We have no heating there. People were like this. And in the end, almost everybody was dancing to Brazilian music. They had never heard this kind of music before, but they were dancing. And they were eating Brazilian food, even vegetarian food. And they were happy with it. Hmm. And so this is this is what we try to do. You know, we want to we want to show. We want to show people, look, this is possible and it's not bad. Mm -hmm. you know? It's nice. It yeah. improves your life. It gives something to you. Yeah. yeah. And we do that in every in every area, in ecology, intercultural experience, uh, energy, whatever, everything. Next thing you should try is cooking class. So I'm coming yeah. from uh, Southeast Asia and there Aha. they have a lot of cooking classes. So it's uh, some sort of a tourist experience. You go to any small place mm -hmm. or big place and they have cooking classes. And now they also offer traditional dishes, but the vegetarian versions. Like you can do a fur, you know, Vietnamese fur, just vegetarian. And uh, and they found this experience amazing. And you know, like for me, I mean, I started a longer time ago, but they also didn't know any uh, vegetarian recipe. I didn't know how to start, so I learned it by myself. But once you go and you see and you experience it, it's uh, much easier to reproduce it afterwards at home. This is such a brilliant idea. Thank you so much, Dianara. <laughs> we will do that because we have, as I told you, we have two brilliant cooks and one is the, the mother of one of our partners, of Magda. And she is amazing. And she did all the, she made all the food for our Mexican weekend two years ago. Uh, really typical Mexican stuff. Wonderful. It was so delicious. I mean, she's completely with us and uh, we will do that. <laughs> We will do that. I mean, everybody everybody loves to cook there. I mean, the women cook. Of course, the men don't do anything. <laughs> but the women cook. <laughs> and they they love to cook. And they cook well. And um, brilliant idea. Thank you so much for that. You're very welcome. Talk about that with my wife right afterwards. <laughs> what else keeps inspiring you? What gives you force despite all the difficulties you face? Well, this is one of the main points, realizing that we're not alone mm -hmm. and to see what we can achieve if we work together, if, if we stay with open arms and open hearts and open minds and embrace all the people that, that want to work with us and unite with us. Working with nature is something that gives you hope. And uh, when, when you see how nature grows uh, and, and, and develops when you let it, yeah? When you develop a feeling for nature, I mean, I'm I'm a big city guy. I've lived, I, I come from a small town, but I've lived in huge cities for all my life. I've actually, I've not come back. I actually migrated to this uh, apparently small world, uh, rural world. I'm seeing all the little wonders in nature. And that is something that gives me hope. Yes. Thank you very much, Nikolaus. That was super inspiring, I would really say. <laughs> And I wish you and your project all the best and hope uh, you will continue planting uh, yourself or with others uh, more tiny forests around Poland and uh, will really drive this movement also for Europe. Thank you very much. You're more than welcome. It was a pleasure to talk with you. That was a wonderful discussion. I am really impressed by Nikolaus' actions. After talking to people with words and images during his filmmaking career, Nikolaus turned into real action. And indeed, the most efficient way of changing people's habits is to provide real-life experience. Experience that is pleasant instead of being threatening, 
experience that enriches, experience that adds meaning to life and connection to others. If you want to support Nikolaus' project, I provide a link to the donation page in the description. Interested in planting a tiny forest yourself? I highly recommend to watch the TED Talk by Shubhantu Sharma that Nikolaus mentioned previously. It is less than five minutes, but it is mind-blowing and extremely inspirational. Mr. Sharma also provides free video lectures on YouTube to explain how to plant a tiny forest by yourself. You can find all the links in the description. And of course, you are welcome to reach out to Nikolaus for more information about his project or how to start your own tiny forest. I hope you enjoyed this episode and found it inspiring. With any questions, comments or suggestions, please email me at scgrowpodcast at gmail.com. And until next episode, stay green, stay inspired. Bye-bye.